Praise the Lord. As we gather together in prayer, we bow our heads. Father, we thank you for this awesome, holy privilege to stand on holy ground among each other, your holy people, in your holy presence. Father, thank you that where two or three are gathered together in your name, Jesus, you are here. You are here in reality, not in a figment of our imaginations, not in a theological way, but in a reality. You, Jesus Christ, Lord of glory, are in this place, and it is now holy ground. So let the words that be spoken today be yours, Holy Spirit. Let T.C. Hudgens disappear and let, yours, let your way take place. Let your words come forth. Let your will be demonstrated. For we must hear from heaven. We must walk with heavenly glory. We must walk in heavenly dignity. We must walk in heavenly holiness. We must walk in heavenly consecration in this final battle. For we you no longer have the luxury to dip in and out of your presence and survive this end time battle. So speak to us. Take over this service and let the kingdom's will be heard in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen. 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 Give him a great big praise. I'd like to welcome everybody all, all over the internet. If I am speaking fast, it's because one, the Spirit of God is very strong on me, and I'm just being agitated, stirred up, and energized. I'm also very broken right now because I know what I'm about to release and about what I'm about to say is heard by the Spirit of God, and it will most definitely be rejected by most of the body of Christ. So how many of you know if you're going to walk with God, you have to please God and not man? Amen. 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 And how many of you know the pastor does not have an axe to grind? I'm not against any of the brethren. Amen. I'm not against men and women of God. But I do have to speak what God tells me, whether they agree with me or not. Amen. 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 I have to speak what God has told this servant to speak and say, thus saith the Lord. Amen. And if I hear from God, so be it. If I miss God, so be it. I'm accountable for obeying God in my revelation, my understanding. And sometimes that's extremely, extremely hard to live with because there are times when God will tell you to say, uh, say something and release an understanding of something that nobody in the world agrees with you. It makes you sound like you're crazy even to yourself. I remember three, four, five years ago, I said, judgment's coming, shaking's coming. Everything that's not of God is going to be shaken out right from under your feet. How many of you know that there's a lot of people in this world that have lost everything? Yeah. Exactly as the Spirit of God told me to speak it when nobody wanted to hear it. I was labeled doom and gloom, fanatical, not hearing God or under grace. I was attacked by everybody that carried a Bible. But time plays out whether you hear from God or not. I also said very clearly that when it happens, our lives will never be the same again, good night. Amen. Now that's being echoed to the governments of the world. But when I said it, nobody agreed with me. I also said that churches will be closed and fall apart no longer even exist. They'll never even come back into existence. As I stand here and speak before you under the anointing of God right now, there's church, most churches have yet to go back into heaven services. For all practical purposes, they don't, do not exist as far as the world is concerned. Because the world's not getting on the internet trying to find a church service. Amen. So as far as the world's concerned, that church is gone. Exactly as the man of God spoke. Amen. Just as sure as I knew I heard from God then, and I tell you I hear, I'm hearing from God now. Now I'm going to teach on prayer. But I have to lead up to that by saying a few words prophetically 
that most of the body of Christ will not want to hear. If I was an intercessor, I would live on videos of Jeannie Wilkerson, Billy Graham, Rachel T. Patillo, Clary Grace, Annette Hammond, and these intercessors that have broken ground, the good ones, I would live on that. I would, I would feed, even if you're not called as an intercession prayer warrior, you have to live in intercession between now and the rapture, I promise you. Intercession is no longer a luxury of those that have the grace to be called into it, but the body of Christ has to live in it. The body of Christ has to now live as intercessors, whether they like that or not, they no longer have the luxury to say, well, that's for Sister Mary, and that's for Sister Judy, and that's for Sister Teresa, and that's for those that have that special touch. No. You're going to have to live in intercession because that's where your commands from heaven are coming. That's where your protection from heaven are coming. That's where your ability to wage effective warfare for your survival and the rescue of lost souls comes from. We no longer have the luxury of not being intercessors. Amen. Somebody say hallelujah. 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 Now here's what I'm saying as a prophet of God to the ministers all over the world. Not every, and they're going to, that's not all of them, just like you say something about anybody. Well, not all of them. And then you say something about anything. Well, not all of them. And that's the song of the compromisers that want to get along with both realms. I realize not every pastor, not every church, but the vast majority of word of faith brethren that I was raised up under are doing exactly what all generations of God's manifested purpose do. In other words, old line Pentecostals that had that, that got baptized with the Holy Spirit. Methodists, Presbyterians did not want to go into the fullness of the Holy Ghost move. And they camped there and died there. But the Word of God says that we are developed into the image of Christ and the fullness of God, line upon line, glory to glory, until we come into the fullness of the glory of the statue of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And then after the Pentecostal move was, was the charismatic move, and then the Word of Faith move. And each one stays there and refuses to adapt and grow into the next move of God. And my Word of Faith brethren are doing exactly the same thing. Churches in general are doing exactly the same. They don't want to hear it's time for warfare. They don't want to hear Jesus is coming. They don't want to hear it's time to, to get into battle. They don't want to hear that, that we're out of time. They don't want to hear that it's not all about me anymore. They do not want to hear it. But I'm telling you, as sure as I'm standing here as a man of God, thus saith the Lord. It's time the spirit of God's emphasis has shifted. And if you don't shift with it, it's very hard to survive. Because other moves of God had years and years and years to finally, okay, I guess I'll go on with the wave of God, the move of God, the spirit, the foundation that the spirit's laying down. We don't have that luxury. We either get into the flow of the spirit or we will die in battle. How many Christians you know freaking out because they don't go to church, they, they, they have, they're locked up in their houses, they are, they, it's, it's called COVID-13 stress syndrome. Why? Because they don't walk in the spirit. Because no. they don't persevere past what the principality of this world are laying upon the earth. They adapt to it and let it dominate them. Amen. And if you think this is where it stops, you're crazy already. This is the beginning of sorrows. This is the beginning of woes. And if you can't walk past this illusion and, 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 and demonic deception, you'll never stand till the rapture. I know Christians are doing this if you get six feet within their six foot zone. They forgot that Christ is the healer. They forgot they have dominion and authority. They forgot that greater is he that is in them than he that's in the world. They forgot that the sick is supposed to come to you. They forgot that you're supposed to cast out them. They forgot who they are and the reason they came from. And it's time to go on into the demonstration and the manifestation of
of everything you've learned. The Holy Ghost is no longer to speak in tongues and be excited in service. It's to guide me, empower me, and lead me into safety and victory. It's time to go into this next wave. And the next wave is this. Listen to me. This, the, if, you, if you have a Bible-based understanding, you'll understand. That's absolutely right, Pastor, because Jesus has been saying that for 2,000 years. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added unto you. But it's time to shift the emphasis of your prayers from supplication and request to dominion and authority. Yeah. Let me say it again. Most Christians' prayers are, this is what I need, this is what I want, and this is who somebody else needs this, and God, won't you, can't you, will you? It's time to shift out of all that and get your focus into taking dominion, exercising authority, and fighting God's battles. Amen. From supplication to dominion. And if you don't make this shift, you won't be strong enough to stand. You're going, to be duck, you're going to be ducking darts like you have never ducked before in your life, praying hopeful, hope so prayers. Will you, God, prayers? Do you hear me, God? When you should be up, engaged in battle, Amen. reaping the harvest, demonstrating the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ, establishing the kingdom of God, driving back the gates of hell. See, look with me very quickly over here at 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Matter of fact, don't even turn there. I want to speed up so I can get most of this in. 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Just write it down and please, please, please study it later. Amen. Are we good, Pastor Allen? Amen? Verse 32. And the children of Ishakar. Which were men that had understanding of the times. Mark that, never forget it. There's a special anointing that we need to tap into. I would sub submit to you and request that you write that down in your notes and make it a petition to God during your intercession. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. I would make it a point of request and petitioning with God in my intercessory prayer. God, give me the Holy Ghost wisdom to understand the times I live in. Amen. How many of you know most of the body of Christ don't? They're still all about me. Is there a latte machine in the lobby? I come to church to feel good, and the rest of the world can go to hell. They do not understand or discern the times they live in. And if you're not walking in the true anointing of the Holy Ghost, you will whine and cry your way with a latte in one hand and a prayer request in the other right into your own destruction in the heat of battle. Amen. Now, I know that sounds hard, but it's true. Amen. And I'm trying to warn you. With the same prophetic anointing that spoke four years ago of the day we live in now. The sons of Ishakar had a special God-given anointing on them. They could discern the times they lived in. And in that discerning, God gave them understanding of what they ought to do. Amen. That is the prophetic voice to this generation right now. You need to get discernment from the Holy Ghost to understand the days you're living in right now. So you know how to behave and conduct yourself in these days. Would you, could you, and don't you hear me anymore, God? We'll get you killed. Look at somebody say, I love you, but it's time to grow up. I love you, but it's time to grow up. It's time to shift from all about me to being a doer of God's will in the land. Amen? Amen. Can I hear a hallelujah? hallelujah? All right. Now look very quickly at 2 Kings chapter 5. I'm going to cover very quickly a bunch of scriptures that you already know, but you'd be amazed how many Christians don't know it. Amen? Amen. Second Kings chapter 5. This is, in this entire chapter, the discourse is this. Elijah the, the, Elijah the prophet came. He's already confronted the prophets of Baal. He slew how many of them? 480 of them, I believe it says. Then God says, okay, now transfer your mantle to Elisha. The transfer of anointing from one generation, watch closely, from one generation to another has now taken place. 
If that transference did not take place properly, the whole nation would have suffered because they wouldn't have been doing what God wanted at that time. I'm talking to this generation. The reason the church is shut down, ineffective, irrelevant, even though they spent the last 20 years trying to be relevant, they're completely irrelevant to the world in the middle of the world's disaster because they didn't shift in anointing, mantle, and purpose when the transfer took place. God's been saying for 15 years you need to change. And we want to have laughing parties. We, we still want to have conventions saying the same thing over and over again. How to get your best house, your best life now, your new car. And if you have a new house and you have a new car or you're getting one, that's fine. You'll see the context here in just a minute. Amen. Amen. Jesus didn't say you can't have anything. He said don't pursue it. Pursue the kingdom of God. These things God will make sure you get. Yeah. Any man sacrificing house, home, mother, father, brother, sister, will receive in this lifetime a hundredfold more than what they've sacrificed and eternal life in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. But we don't believe that. So we spent 20 years going to seminars all about me and what I can get. Come on. While they're dying and going to hell. And now Satan has taken us completely out of the picture for the most part. And the world has no place to turn. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Glory to God. So the transfer has taken place. And all the prophecy, the, pro the mantle that was on Elijah is now on Elisha. Now Elisha is beginning his ministry. He's got a servant under him named, Ge named Gehazi. Are you with me? Yes. Do you understand the, the story now? Do you remember all that? Yes. Now look at 2 Kings chapter 2. What did I say? 2 Kings 5? I'm sorry. 2 Kings chapter 5. And we're going to pick up, this is the story of Naaman the leper. Now listen to me. Look at Pastor real quick. i got to talk fast. Just write stuff down and stay locked in with me, okay? Yeah. So we're going to be reading here. Write it down now so I can come back to it. In chapter 5, verse 25. Amen? Amen. Now look at Pastor. This story of Naaman is a man that's looking at a death sentence, but he's a captain of the entire military of a foreign country. He is a dignitary. Do you understand the mantle and anointing that God wants to drop on each and every one of you? As warriors of God, Harvesters of the kingdom, uh, throwers of the net for the end time generation of the lost, the anointing that's on you will have to be so strong, so self confident in Christ Jesus, you can start standing in front of people that used to intimidate you and say, Thus said the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, what started this whole conflict was Naaman knew there was a great uh, prophet that lived there, and he was sub submitted enough that he would go to a great prophet, but he found himself dealing with a servant of the prophet, and that insulted him. Amen. The people you used to insult are going to be coming to you, and you better stand in boldness and authority. Because Amen. Amen. I promise you, what you're seeing now, pe people, there's people in this world that will never, ever get their jobs back. There's businesses that will never exist again. There's lives turned upside down, gone as we know it. And it's going to get worse. You're cares of me. No, I'm prophetically warning you. I'm interceding you. This is grace working for you. Yes. Amen. Amen. It's going to get worse. And people that were so high on their self-exalted little totem poles will crumble at your feet and say, My God, do you have any answers for me? And you better speak with authority and boldness and not worry about them being offended by you. Amen. Yes. 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 So Naaman comes. But he went and stood before his master and Elisha. Now here's what happens. Are you listening? Are you listening? Yes. Naaman was so excited that he finally got healed. He said, let me bless you. Here's where you better watch your heart. The preeminence that God's going to give you in this hour is not for you to be accepted by him. Amen. The preeminence that God's going to bring his body of Christ 
is not for the purpose of getting their goods, even though they'll want to bless you. The whole thing he's trying to get us away from is pursuing goods in our life as preeminent and principal things and just doing his will. And they'll try to blur that by blessing you. So Naaman comes to Elijah and says, let me bless you. Elijah said, no, I'll have none of it. His servant standing there that hasn't walked in the fullness of that anointing. He's just following the prophet, but he doesn't have the revelation of the prophet. What's lacking in the story? Understanding that you can only get from the Holy Ghost. If you don't know how to transition, it will get you killed. So this servant of the prophet that's in line being trained as the next one to take the mantle. Amen. Amen. Doing exactly for Elisha what Elisha did for Elijah. So this is no small position Gehazi stands in. Amen. If something should happen to Pastor T.C. between now and the rapture, you are obligated. One of you men and women of God are obligated to come up here and take this mantle. Yeah. And if he says, prepare yourself, I'm taking you home like he did to Elijah, then I have to be able to hear him instead of just dying and leaving the church in confusion. Amen. And knowing which one to drop the mantle on so that when I go, this church doesn't go the way like every other church that I've ever been in. Even Ed Colville, when I did a service, they were, the Spirit of God warned me. Satan's going to scatter this church. I warned him at his funeral service. Don't let this church die. They couldn't get rid of the church fast enough. Nobody wanted to take up the mantle. What the man worked for for 40 years doesn't even exist. I think that's a reproach. So here again, as I stand here, this guy's rich. Well, sure he's rich. He's taken off. He offered us a lot. Elisha said, it's not, no, I'll have none of it. Well, Gehazi waited until the dust cleared, and he went running down the road to Naaman, and he told Naaman, he goes, hey, look, I'll take it. And Naaman said, not only take that, take twice that much. He was a very grateful man. Now watch this. If you're still looking for the ministry that you're called to to bless you, you're going to get in trouble. You, may, you have got to get a shift in what we're living for right now. Look at this. And he went and stood before his master, and Elisha said unto him, he's come back and hid everything. He, he came back with twice as much wealth as Elisha was offered. So yeah, somebody might want to hire you at their church, like we see already happening here. Or we'll put you on payroll for twice as much as TC would ever offer. Better watch yourselves. I'm going to go over there. There's a position for me. Better watch yourselves. Elisha didn't pick the position. Elijah picked him. Because God picked him. Amen? That's why you need to stop kicking against the pricks when I come up and say, I want you to do this in the church. Well, that's because God told me to tell you that. So the problem is don't panic, coward, run away, and never come back. The, the problem is submit, learn, and be what God's wanting you to be. Yes. Every time I tell somebody that, that this is what God's wanting you to do, they, they always want to panic. Elisha was plowing, minding his own business, happy being a farmer. And God says, you're now a prophet. <laughs> what do you do? He dropped everything and obeyed. That's your key. That's your key in this last hour. With spirits of madness poured upon the earth. Amen? Yeah. And Elijah said unto him, where, where are you coming from, Gehazi? And he said, uh, there's, there, there's, your, your servant didn't go anywhere. I, I'm not coming back from any place. And he said unto him, went not my heart with you when the man turned again with his chariots to meet you? Is it a time to receive money and receive garments and receive olive yards and receive vineyards and sheep and goats and oxen and men servants and maid servants? Is this the time to worry about your prosperity? 
No, it's a time to do battle for God's end time purpose. Amen. Now watch. And the leprosy, therefore, that Naaman of Naaman shall cleave to thee and unto your seed forever. And he went out from the presence of the prophet a leper, white as snow. Now listen to me. If you don't make the shift in your heart, stop pursuing your best life now. Money, cars, boats, planes, fame, and everything that you grew, grew, grew up wanting to be over God's plan for your life. The curse that's on the world is going to start coming on the church like never before. How many of you remember when I said there's judgment coming on the entertainment industry? Amen. Judgment's coming on the athletic industry. Yes. Judgment's coming on all forms of entertainment. How many years ago did we say that, Pastor Tony? At least three years ago. Now you're living it. Boo hoo and me for years. If you don't make the shift, put God first, as Jesus always said. What the world is enduring will come on you. You are protected from the curses of the world, living under the shadow of the Almighty, not in a divided heart in both realms. It's impossible to please God and stay safe that way. Amen? 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 All right. Now look with me over here in the New Testament very quickly. Mark chapter 11, verse 20. We'll start with verse 20. Mark 11, 20. I got 10 minutes to finish this teaching, so let's speed up. Just write it down and say amen. 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 Mark chapter 11, verse 20. Uh, let's start at verse 22. And Jesus answered, we all know about the parable of the fig tree. Amen? amen. He went to it, wanted something to eat, nothing was on it, so he cursed it. Jesus, by the Spirit, comes to you, Brandon, and says, Brandon, I want to use you. There's nothing in you that says yes. The curse of the world comes on you. That's what I'm trying to say. It's all through the Bible. You either say yes to the Lord or you say yes to the curse that comes on those that rebuke the Lord and refuse the Lord. Why did Jesus heal people and say, now go and sin no more, let something seven times greater come upon you? When you're healed and delivered, it's time to live right. Now, I'm not making this stuff up. This isn't Tommy's doctrine. It's all the way through the Holy Word of God. Amen. Our master said that over and over again. All right, I've come into you. I've ministered to you. I've heard the cry of your heart. Your Savior's here. I'm healing you. Now go and sin no more. Change your life. Because next time you're crying out to me, you'll be ten times stricken worse than you are right now. This isn't a game with the Lord. It's not a game with the devil. Preachers have made it a game. In this generation, between now and the rapture, that curse will cleave to you and you won't be able to shake it off. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Are you ready? Amen. And Jesus said to said there, have faith in God. We know that means have the God kind of faith that speaks, creates, and it manifests. Amen? Amen. We've been teaching this for 30 years. And look what he says here. And whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed. Our mountain sign, monumental size oppositions and resistance. Amen. Amen? Amen. Most of us can't blow an ant off of a small anthill right now. But he's trying to teach us to move monumental resistance. Come on. Which is this hour. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt this heart, but shall believe those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he said. How many of us have heard a dozen teachings on that? How many of us, many of us live it? Very few Christians after 20 years of Copeland Conventions, Hagen Conventions, and every other faith convention can still even live that. They can't blow the fuzz off of a peach. Well, how come? Because between the praying it and saying amen and the manifestation of there it is, they make a multitude of mistakes. 
You can't get on your knees and say, God, I know you always hear me. And he does. And I know you love me. And he does. And the Bible says this. And it does. This is not a false, as the world wants to claim it, name it and claim it, demonic false doctrine. It is absolutely Bible. Amen. But first of all, we spent 20 years requesting and supplicating for me, myself, and I. That's all changing now. But this is true and it works. But when you get up off your knees after taking the word to the Lord, praying the word to the Lord, releasing faith out of your heart, saying, Amen, thank you, Father. I believe it's done. Turn around, and now there's a time gap between the amen and the manifestation of, there it is, God work, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Most people never see that day. How many of you have prayed a, a thousand prayers you've yet to see manifested? Folks, I'm telling you, this wasn't designed every single time you pray. Okay, we've got to wait 20 years. That's just the example of Abraham. Jesus didn't lay hands on people and say, be healed, be healed, I'll be back in 20 years. It's not designed to take that long. What's causing the delay? What's causing the absence of results? Wrong living between the amen and the there it is. You can't say amen and do all kinds of silliness in between. If, if it aborts, stops, res resists, hinders, and slows down, the there it is. And in that process, Satan comes in, accuses Father to you, accuses the Word to you, and you walk away disgruntled, cursing God and telling Him and everybody you know that Bible stuff don't work. Come on. Glory to God. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Amen. Hallelujah to the King. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 4, verse 18. Talking about Father Abraham, the father of faith. Amen. Now watch this. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. When? When he was already too old? When his body was already worn out, feeble, and unproductive? When his wife, all her eggs died? When everything he saw and everything he looked at the myriad said it's impossible. So your circumstances, your personal, physical, and social condition has nothing to do with the authority or power of God's promises. Amen. It's never too late. You're never too old. You're never too barren. You never have. Faith doesn't look at resources. It looks at God. Yes. Faith doesn't look at people. It looks to God. Faith doesn't look at yourself. It looks to God. Amen. So the second you say amen and start surveying your surroundings and looking at people around you, well, they don't believe with me, and they're not working with me, and they're not cooperating. You've already lost the amen there it is. You've turned, you've let go of faith and look at flesh. Faith produces kingdom results with nothing natural to demonstrate it. Faith doesn't need anybody helping you. It just needs you and God in agreement. Your resources come from heaven at that point, not what you see. How many of you would have dreamed a year ago we'd be sitting in this facility right now? But months before we came, the prophet said God's getting ready to move us, didn't he? Before COVID, didn't he? And most of you didn't have the faith to receive it. Oh, they wait. We can't afford this. Here we are. I didn't need your agreement for God to do what he, God needed my agreement. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now look. He believed, he released hope against hope that he might become the father of many nations 
according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being, I underline this, not weak, in faith, he considered not, I underline that, his own body. He didn't look at what looked impossible in the natural. He considered it, thought about it, gave it no attention whatsoever. Now, if you're going to survive between now and the amen or now and the rapture, you've got to stop being moved by everybody that's moved around you. Like I said, i got Christian friends that will circle around me like this in fear. They go to Word of Faith churches because I got within their six-foot COVID safety zone. Amen. What is that? Locked up in what they see, yes. what they hear, and their senses. They've stopped every prayer they pray. They're completely out of the spirit, controlled by the prince of the power of this age and world. More submitted and obedient to hell than heaven. Let me remind you, should you obey God or man? God. God. That's why we're sitting here today. He did what? Gave no consideration to his bank account. No consideration to how old he was. No consideration to how much doubt Sarah was in. And said, yeah, Lord. If you're going to get your amen answered and the there it is in your life and living in victory between now and the rapture, you have got to stop looking, feeling, and sensing any natural influence around you and keep the faith that you had in your heart absolutely every second of every day until it happens. And I trust you, Satan will come immediately. Who does he come through first? Folks that are hiding the agenda by saying, Now, I love you, brother, but. I love you, sweetheart, but. I love you, man of God, but. And here comes the devil. Going to lovingly pick every bit of faith out of your heart. Come on. Between now and the rapture, you've got to set it right now. I don't care if... There's not another church in America agrees with me. I'm sticking in faith. Amen. I don't care if, if my brethren are turning me into the authorities because they shut down and I didn't. I'm not bowing. I'm staying in faith. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you right now, you shut down the vast majority of all the prayers in your congregation the day you locked your doors, Pastor. They saw you bow, all your people are bowing, I guarantee it. And they're waiting for the government to give permission to leave the house, get a job, go to church, go to a restaurant, control the effects and lead their lives day to day. Literally day to day. Amen. Amen. They've taken the place of the Holy Ghost and Jesus Christ himself. Being strong means you don't let things of the natural influence you. God said it. I'm going to do it. God said it. Not my wife. Not my friends. Not the church. I'm going to do it. Amen. He staggered not. Verse 20. He stayed, He didn't wobble around. He, did, he didn't change his, the position of his faith. He kept the platform of his believing in one place, in faith, on the foundation of faith in Christ. Yeah, but here you go, staggering around like a drunk man. Well, what did they do it? And you, you just walk right off the foundation of faith. I don't care what anybody else is doing. I care about what that Bible says, what the Spirit has spoken to me, and whether I'm going to stand strong in exactly that and that alone. Amen. 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 All right, so what do you got to do? You got to be strong in faith. Strong in faith means you stop looking, feeling, sensing, hearing, and receiving, and you stagger not. You let nothing be the consideration of what God said. Amen. You let nothing have influence over what God said. You let none of your feelings dictate what God has said. Amen. 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 All right. What happened here? Exactly what Pastor T.C. said earlier. God gave Abraham the desire of his heart. What did Abraham always have? Always have a desire for a baby. 
Who put that desire in her? God. Why? Because he wanted Abraham to have a baby to start a generation of covenant people of faith. So the desires of your heart are put there for God, for God's purpose, not your pleasure. Amen. And until we stop perverting that, we'll never see the amen. Because that's not what God wants us to come into existence for. He wants to do it to establish his covenant kingdom purpose in the earth, not your will. Amen. The Abraham desire was the plan of God all along. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, Mark chapter 4 again. Or Mark, this time instead of 11, chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. You get up off your knees, you say amen, you prayed in agreement with the word of God. You're willing to stand in faith. Now look what happens in Mark chapter 4. It's all about the word, amen? amen. It's all about amen. the sower sowing the word, amen? amen? We love you guys. I'm sorry that we, we, we couldn't get further down the road. But it's good so far. Amen. Amen. Watch the video and leave comment. Yes. Are you guys learning something today? Amen. Before they leave, say, I love you, Pastor Tony. Love, love you, Pastor Tony. Love you, Pastor Teresa. Love you, Pastor Teresa. Amen. God bless them. As a matter of fact, just give them a great big hand clap. We love you, guys. Precious, precious servants of God and such a tremendous blessing to this body of Christ. Amen. All right. So Mark chapter 4 is plainly about what? The word of God going forth and the power of the word of God if it's not contaminated or interfered with. Amen? Amen. But look here with me very closely at verse 15. This is what I want to lock into. And these are they by the wayside, wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard the word, watch closely. Satan cometh immediately. Satan cometh immediately. How fast does the battle start after the amen? How fast does, how long does it take for most Christians to lose the battle after the amen? Most of the time within a day. Most of the time, when you pray prayers, two days later, you forgot what you prayed. That shows you how important it was to you in the first place and how willing you are to protect it in the second place. Then two or three years later, you look, well, I prayed for that. God didn't answer me. You didn't defend it. You got up and it immediately left the, your heart, the focus of your heart. You look back and say, oh yeah, I prayed for one of those. Well, where is it? I guess God didn't want me to have one. No, the battle started in many, 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 many cases. You get up off your knees, walk into another room, and all hell's breaking out through your relatives. Where are you been? We've been wanting to talk to you. And, and now you're in strife. Well, we, there it goes. Or you say, amen, you're in the spirit, the phone rings, distracts you completely, and you go one, two, three, four days, not giving it another thought, other things pop in, you get into unforgiveness, get into strife, get into pursuing something else, and you never stand in one spot. Listen, most, what would be, what would happen, I, I'll tell you who's notorious for this, is Alan. I don't like buying anything over the internet. I hate it. I want to touch it. I want to feel it. I want to smell it. I want to try it on. I hate getting it not the right size, sending it back. I don't like it. I, I detest that. He loves ordering stuff on the internet. He doesn't mind sending it back. It's a constant flow of little brown boxes on our front door all the time. <laughs> Ding dong. Brown box. Here we go. I don't ask who it is. I ask what it is. <laughs> what did he order now? I mean, little stuff like that. Great big stuff. He ordered stuff for his car. I got, I got boxes on the front porch. Alan, something came for you, son. <laughs> I want to kick it. I want to look at it. I want to feel it. He shops online. All right, so he orders a $500 part for his car. And we decide to move next week. Where is the package going to go? Where it was originally requested. 
It doesn't follow the changes of your mind. Come on. And if you don't have the forethought to remember what you ordered and make sure it tracks and you're in track with it together, you're going to be repositioned, staggered off to another platform, but it's going to be delivered where you ordered it and fall to the ground. Come on. You've got to be in the same ex exact position spiritually when it knocks on your door as when you said, release the order by prayer and supplication. 99.9% .9 of the Christians don't. They move positionally in their heart. Within minutes of actually saying amen. Why? Because Satan comes immediately. He doesn't goof around for a couple of weeks. He starts distracting, hindering, compromising instantly. When's the battle start? When does the battle start? Immediately. Immediately after you get up off your knees and seconds after the amen. Know this, that when you come to the kingdom to request the kingdom to come to you, that kingdom's going to come to stand between you and that kingdom. Immediately. So that later it can accuse the God of that kingdom and the Lord of your glory. Prayer works. Faith works. But you have got to do mature spiritual things in the, in the meantime. Know that the battle's coming. Know that no good thing comes unhindered. No. Know that all the promises of God are yes and amen from God, but how dare you from hell. Did you hear me? Yeah. Was well, Satan stronger? Only if you let him be through stupidity and ignorance of the word and immaturity of posture. Come on. He comes quick, fast, and in a hurry, and he is the accuser of God and the brethren. There's nothing he loved more than to make it look like God doesn't love you. God didn't answer your prayer, and why bother talking to a God that doesn't care about you in the first place? He loves to rub your nose in the failures of your immaturity and blame it on God. Come on, brother. You know what else? You'll turn into an evangelist of hell, too. It's not just a matter. You know, most people don't go, now, Father God, I know you're true. I know this is true, and I haven't seen any results, so the problem's got to be with me. Now, Father, talk to me and show me where I'm missing it. This doesn't change. And if you don't have the maturity to do that, you're going to start evangelizing for hell. That faith stuff doesn't work. That's false doctrine. They're just after your money. Stop that nonsense. You never know what God's going to do. God's sovereign. Just serve him. Hope for good things and hope you don't die early. And you'll preach that to everybody that will listen. Come on. Come on, He'll literally use you to evangelize and pass that, 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 that discouragement of unanswered prayer and lack of faith to everybody you know. You can find it all over the internet. I'm telling you God's true. I'm telling you God answers prayer. I'm telling you he'll do whatever his word said he'll do. But when you get up, you better live right. You better not stagger. You better stay strong. And you better get ready for battle right on the spot. And stay ready for battle every second of every day. And move not. Stagger not. Give not up. Draw not back. But wave the banner of Jesus Christ higher, louder, and stronger. Every battle of every day until the breakthrough. Amen. Look at Daniel. Daniel prayed. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden... 21 days later, Gabriel shows up. It says, the moment you prayed, Daniel, highly favored of God, I was released from heaven. But the prince of Persia withstood me 21 days. Daniel's prayer kicked heaven into action and hell into action at the same amen. His prayer was heard. The moment he said amen, warfare kicked into effect 21, later, 
21 days later, a fierce kingdom battles, he saw, there it is. But if you're not mature, you get up, look around. I guess it doesn't work. God don't care. Why am I praying anyway? Then guess what happens to the heavenly host? They're not continuing a battle you're not engaged in. They're not continuing the battle you started and refuse to stay engaged in. Well, that's good. Kind of like, Father, me and Darlene would like to have a baby. Well, Bubba, when she gets pregnant, you've got to raise it now. You've got to stay engaged in it. Most of us are just throwing out good thoughts of what would be nice, but we don't want to invest in it. Folks, this is good stuff. I hope you're getting this. So when does the battle start? Are you sure? How many battles have you been in already and didn't realize it? You just pray and wonder how come it didn't work. You didn't engage in the battle and started immediately. You didn't brace yourself aware that Satan comes immediately over that prayer. Specifically because of your prayer. One, that tells you how important you are. Two, that tells you how powerful your prayers truly are. And three, if they don't start immediately resistance, there's something of the kingdom that God wants that you have effect in. Or you wouldn't rally the host of hells against you. Amen. Amen. Isn't that good? Amen. All of you sitting out here thinking you're weak and insignificant to the kingdom of God and the kingdom of hell, nothing could be farther from the truth. Nothing could be farther from the reality. Now I want to point something out to you very quickly here. When does Satan come? Immediately. Amen. I got a Pentecostal lost my place. I want to read that one more time, just lock it into our spirit. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. The word is sown. The word, the word always works. Every one of these people heard it. Every one of them had an effect. But every one of them didn't take the right action after the word came. Some were shallow. Some were distracted. Some were just choked to death. This plainly teaches right there. When you pray, here comes Satan with the cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, and lust of other things. To choke out the word. Every battle you've ever been in since you were saved, it was all about the word, not you. You're just the vessel. You're the container that germinates the manifestation of God's will and kingdom in the earth. So if he can contaminate the kingdom, he's, or the container, he stops the kingdom. He can get you disgruntled, staying at home, talking about God doesn't this, and God doesn't that, and God this, and God that. The kingdom's never manifested. Amen? Amen. Now, look over here in John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And what the Spirit of God wants to bring out with absolute undeniable clarity. Undeniable clarity is the seriousness of that battle. And this is going to help you folks. Please listen to this. John 10, 10. Are you ready? Everybody's heard this scripture a hundred times. Now let's get some revelation out of it, okay? John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus is talking. The thief, say thief. thief. The devil, devil. cometh 
Just stop right there. Once you say amen, who comes? Who are you going to be more aware of responding in the affairs of your life? The Holy Spirit or, or, or demonic spirits? You got to get this. Or you'll constantly be swinging at things that don't be, need, need to be addressed and ignore things that need to be swung at. When you get up off your knees and pray amen, heaven moves, hell moves. Who are you going to be more aware of manifesting in your life? Well, how, how many people in your circle are so full of the Holy Ghost, you feel the Holy Ghost every time they're around? Almost zero. How many people around you manifest the devil? With no problem whatsoever around you. Most. So who's going to be more influential after you get off your knees in visitation, the Holy Spirit or, or hell? You're going to be much more in tune and affected by hell first. Because most of the people that are around you in your day-to-day -day life are demonically inspired, not Holy Ghost inspired. And more easily used by hell than they ever will be by God. So you're, the battle's on, and the first thing you're going to start sensing is hellishness. Yes. Not heavenly presence, hellish presence. Has anybody prayed enough to find out you start praying and all hell breaks loose? That's exactly what I'm talking about. Because people around you are more easily used as vessels of hell than they've ever been vessels of God. Even the Christians. So it's much easier for demonic influence to start hitting up against your flesh than you sensing the presence of God in agreement to your amen. amen. And I want to point out to you the seriousness of that battle. Look what it says right here. The thief comes. Satan comes. Not but to, for only one reason, are you getting this instantaneous Blow back from all areas every time you try to believe God for something. Am I talking to people? Amen. How many people have asked God sincere heartedly, God, I really, I'd really like for you to do this, or I'd really like to have this, and you're not being covetous, and you're, it's just a real sincere desire of your heart, and all hell breaks loose. Amen. Maybe even over some areas of absolute severe need. You pray for something out of sincere need, and it's like the floodgates of hell open up on you. Amen. You actually experience an increase of, like, like today, the devil did not want me here to teach this. I got a great car. I love my car. I went out, de -de 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 -de, battery's dead. Never had a battery problem yet. He didn't want you to hear this for sure. Because you'll stop, you'll stop missing the mark and become effective in your prayers and effective in battle. And that's the last thing he wants. You, you're out of control as far as he's concerned. But you're under Holy Ghost control. Amen? Now, folks, I cannot express how serious this really gets. I mean serious. Watch this. The thief cometh not... For, for one reason only, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Number one, look at pastor. Until you settle that, get the revelation that, never argue about it again, you'll never be able to stand in battle. You always say, I wonder if this is God or the devil. And a double-minded man receives nothing from the kingdom and stops nothing from hell. If it's stealing, killing, or destroying, it's not God, period. Amen. Oh. Amen. Amen. And sometimes I'm going to hurt your feelings. Sometimes it's not even an immediate attack of hell. You're just throwing it to hell. You're blaming on the devil stuff you're throwing wide open and giving him with an extra bag of chips through lack of discipline, control, Pursuing fleshly desires. I knew that would get a great big amen. 
You can't ask God and the Spirit and go out and party in the world thinking the Spirit continues. You can't ask, come in here in a wheelchair, and I've seen it happen. God heal you and cause you to be able to come back to perfect health and go out clubbing because now you can dance without pain. No, you, you, just, threw, you just threw your health right back into hell's lap. I'm just letting this sink in. How many of our lifestyles or people you know lifestyles going to church weeping, crying, and partying all week? Forget it. You are asking. You're, everything God brought me Sunday, I'm giving right back to you, Satan. And seven times more. You gotta live right. Go and sin no more by something. Seven times worse come upon you. Don't look at me like I'm more cursing you. That's what the master taught us. And when grace comes to warn you, don't 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 act all Pentecostal saying you're word cursing me. I'm gonna go to a love church. Just like the young man that sit in my office in Canton, Texas, when Pastor Darrell was still there. Him and his wife came in for counseling. She loved God with all of her heart. She was married to a knucklehead reprobate that came to church and said openly, I'm only here for her. But she stops picking on me and bugging me. And God gave me a vision of that young man. And I looked at him right square in the eye, as close as I am, a, a desk width away from him. And I said, the Spirit of God just told me, if you don't repent, fall on your knees right here at your wife's feet in front of me and in front of God, you, you're going to die in 24 hours. He threw back his head, laughed, mocked me, and said I was full of S, and walked out laughing at me. Within 24 hours, he was dead. He liked to race his Mustang, and he's racing down the freeway. Brakes went out, rear-ended a tractor trailer with iron uh, beams on the back of it, came through the window, took his head off, they found his head in the back seat. Within 24 hours of the prophet speaking to him, this is life and death stuff, folks. And if it hasn't gotten you killed so far, it's because the God of, the God of great grace has been extended. That, that Don't you dare use grace as an occasion to sin. Amen. I cannot tell you. When it says he comes to steal and kill, he means that. Now listen, here's, what, here's the progression. Most of the time, all he's got to do is steal. You say amen, walk in the other room, and somebody you're married to gets ugly with you. Oh, yeah, well, let me tell you something. Well, he stole it. It's gone. And until you repent and go back, it's, it's gone. It's gone. It's not coming back. That's why you look in those chapters later. When you ask God and have aught against your brother, go forgive first before you even give anything to the altar. Because God won't accept it. Amen. When you're arguing with your wife, you better get it right before the sun goes down so that your prayers be not hindered or Satan move in with you. This stuff is real. And just because preachers don't preach it doesn't mean I'm crazy. Amen. You've got, say with me, you've got to live right. And in this hour, just like this young man within 24 hours. That was the exception. It's going to become the rule. Why do you know that? Because the Bible says in the last days the harvester will overtake the sower. Time is accelerated in the results of our prayer in sowing and reaping. And the harvester bringing in the harvest will actually, as soon as the seed hits the ground, they'll be grabbing it up out, out of the ground. It grows so fast. And it works in reverse, too. You harvest nonsense in hell, and it's going to grow so fast, you better be quick to repent in these days. 
So already he's talking about the same day before sunset comes. We'll go week after week after week, month after month, holding grudges, unforgiveness, get backbiting, murmuring, and gossiping, and wonder, well, I prayed that a year ago. How come, what? How come you're not doing it, God? I had faith. Oh, well, that was stolen months ago. You're so carnal, you just never noticed the thief. Is this all right, or am I hurting your feelings? All kinds of lights should be coming on. Exposing what? What we think is a luxury of lifestyle and choice that is not in the spirit realm. Amen. 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 Good to see you. Oh, you picked the wrong Sunday to visit, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this is the best Sunday to visit. Because you're getting equipped to stand and not be knocked out of your faith anymore. If you have ears to hear and receive the grace to make the changes that now I know so I should do. Amen. 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 I have prayed with people, laid these hands on people and saw the miracles of God that to this day it boggles my imagination. If Tony and Teresa were still here, they'll tell you of the days when they'd walk in and would cast devils out of people. And they'd throw up all over the floor and flop around. I mean demonic deliverance. That's not a time of, God, do you hear me? God, is this your will? God, are you going to do this? Forget it. The battle's on. It's time to exercise authority and dominion. And if you think in these last days with all the gates of hell opened up, you've got the luxury to go home and pray before devils confront you, you're still in La La Land. I've also seen these hands laid on people and God beautifully and divinely healed them. And then they turn around and die. Did God not heal them? No, God healed them. But between the full manifestation of their healing, they started mumbling, murmuring, complaining. And they died. Died blaming it on me and blaming it on God. But the point is this. You resist and it's, he can't steal it from you, then don't try to bring death to get it from you if, if need be. This stuff is serious. And if he can't steal it from you through circumstances of the natural realm around you, he'll try to steal it through circumstances of your body. A lot of battles that you deal with in your body are battles over the kingdom manifesting in God's will in your life. Your body's just the avenue he's trying to get to the reward of the kingdom through. Amen. Is this helping anybody? Amen. It will also explain a lot of why you're under physical attacks. Why does this stuff keep coming on my body? Because you keep standing for the Lord. It's just another level of the same battle. Back here, he tried it through breaking the car down, starting an argument. None of that worked. Okay, blam! Spirit of infirmity comes. Now, are you going to stay on the same platform of faith? Ephesians saying nothing wavering? Corinthians saying casting down thoughts and imaginations? Are you going to say, well, this faith stuff doesn't work, start murmuring, complaining, and it could cost you your life. This is not in there as filler. If you can't steal it from you, he'll kill you to get it from you. And if you can't kill it to get it from you, he'll try to destroy everything in your life around you. Have your kids go off into hell. Have your wife afflict you. Have your job rise up against you. He'll try to destroy everything you love and care about. Are you still going to stand? If you study that out, that's exactly what Job lived through. And in it all, Job stayed righteous and did not curse God. That was the key to victory right there. He got all kinds of bad counsel. Everything he worked for was stolen from him. 
His body was attacked unto death, and everything that he loved and cared about was destroyed around him. And yet he did not change his position and curse God. Amen. That's the moral to the life of Job, not all the other nonsense are taught. Amen. Are you going to stay in faith? And brother, you, you are fighting adversaries that think nothing about killing people you love. Amen. Amen. They throw their head back and laugh in your face when the yes. tears come out of your eyes. Yes. Are you going to stay in faith? Or will it hurt so bad you start accusing God? I guess what the Holy Spirit is trying to say is you have no idea how real this gets. Amen. Amen. It's easy. Oh, I'm a faith person. I'm a faith mm -hmm. preacher. Oh, yes. Yeah, we're, 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 we're the faith people. We're Bible people. Yeah. Easy to play that on Sunday. Amen. Yeah. Amen. When everything you love and care about is under attack because of your stance with God, mm -hmm. will you change it? You have, no, you have no idea how many people have come to me over the years. Many of them out at Living Word in Canton, Texas. Well, Pastor, I love you and I love your preaching, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to another church. But you love me. You love my preach. You love the church. Well, who are you mad at? I'm not mad at anyone. And this, these are the more honest ones. The less honest ones will take a, a take occasion to accuse God and justify their their lack of faith. And Satan loves that. But I've had him come to me and say, Pastor, I love your church, I love you, and I love your teaching, but I'm leaving your church. Why? Because it's just too hard to live for faith. I, I didn't have near this battle of warfare when I was at my other church. I'm going to go over there to serve God, be happy. Have a normal life. I don't want. I don't need this battle. They've surrendered all future prayer. I'm just glad, rejoicing that I'm saved. Go to church. Have a happy little time with Jesus. I don't care if I'm affected. I've seen it dozens of times. Why? Because things that they love, things they held dear, started getting touched by hell. And they knew this. When I were in this church, I didn't have that. Why? Because there's no threat to hell. And the kingdom of God was never going to be able to use you. And that's exactly what Satan wants. And if it takes killing your family to get you to that place, I am here to warn you, it's absolutely a reality. He thinks nothing of killing every one of your children, scattering your marriage, destroying everything you've labored for, just to get you over here and say, God... You don't even care. Why should I serve you anymore? So when I'm telling you that this is serious stuff and it's going to get in your face serious between now and the parting of the eastern sky and the sounding of the trumpet, you better lock into this. And it's going to take that kind of result that always has. But now Satan's all... When the dispensations change and the shifting of God's impetus changes, Satan's always the first one to change with it because he knows if he does it, he'll lose ground. We're the ones digging around thinking I can play for another 20 years and not adapt to God's next requirements. Folks, if you don't mind me saying so, it's awfully quiet in here. Why? Because most of us realize just how much we have not put our hands to. Grace is this. It'll accelerate your ability to stay up. But you've got to get serious. Look at somebody and say, I love you. It's time to get serious. Trust me. I know all over the world there's a thousand churches you can go to. You'll never hear this. It'll be to your detriment. Before the attacks came because you were making a stand. Now they're going to come, and unless you're standing, they'll blow you away so fast you won't even see straight. Look how fast they shut down the entire church. Because it was all rhetoric. When the battle came, it said, BAM! Here's COVID. What are you going to do in the face of the curse? 
oh, I'm going to let the curse now take over, dictate, control me. Or did you say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ? Do not touch me. Do not touch my kids. They're not coming on my property. And you sure as hell aren't keeping me from going to church. Amen. Amen. How many churches did that? One percent. Don't tell me this isn't real. Our whole world has changed in a 24-hour period. And it will never be the same. How much changed in my life? Not one thing. We are seeing just how real this has always been, but now you have no luxury of hiding. Now I look less psycho to people that have their eyes open, but they could have had them open 40 years ago when I was talking on this day. Amen? I'm telling you under that same anointing, the ability to hide is gone. Get in the bed and prepare to die. There are no closet Christians anymore. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? That's fine with me. I was made for this hour. I was created for such a time as this. So were you. Amen. You just don't know it yet. Some of you do. What you're going through physically, what you went through physically was nothing more than to get you off your position in God. Now, I mean, that was all it was about. And he would not mind have killing you at all. Is that what, he doesn't mind taking you out of the picture with death? Paul said this, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But I want to stay for this reason. Not because I'm afraid to die. Not because I want to travel the world and enjoy retirement. It's better for you that I stay. That's the only thing that kept him in faith enough to keep the devil from killing him before God's purpose was finished in his life. Amen. God didn't give you the faith to stand against the spirit of death so that you can enjoy retirement. He gave you the ability to stand against the attack of death so that you can bless those around you with your presence of your ministry here on earth. Let's start wrapping it up. Is this okay, folks? Amen. I know this is pretty powerful, pretty, pretty heavy, full of a lot of revelation. You probably need to watch this, this teaching three or four times. Make notes, get it inside you. Don't let it sound good in your head and forget it in three weeks. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. All right, look over here at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I just quoted it. We might as well look at it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I mean, verse 4. 2 Corinthians 10, 4. We'll start wrapping it up. Man, I'm telling you, this is loaded with... I just feel the presence of God opening up the spirit realm and scales falling off people's eyes right now. Amen. You get this. You'll have no idea how fast God will accelerate you into full kingdom effectiveness in prayer and battle. Amen. Amen? Second Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verse 4 with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And don't, don't we pray over right now releasing the blood of Jesus over Sister Tamara. They have the audacity to go on vacation. Everybody pray. Her priorities are completely messed up. <laughs> <laughs> But we love you, Tamina. Everybody, I'll say talk. We love you, Tamina. She's on vacation, and our hearts are with you, mighty woman of God. Amen? But we're not we're going to pick on her when she gets home. <laughs> All right, verse 4. For the weapons, say weapons, weapons. of our warfare. Wow. Notice the wordage. He didn't say, now the weapons of their warfare, the weapons of my warfare, the weapons of what? Our. our warfare. Now, if we all have weapons, that means we're all expected to be exposed to war. Or you would have no need of weapons. 
The weapons of warfare are weapons of warfare. We're all given weapons because all of us are in war. And the ability for you to hide up till now is gone. Just as everything in the world has changed, nobody can deny it, nobody can escape it, everything in the spirit has shifted, and not one Christian will be able to escape it. You either get in the battle and live and work for God, or you'll try to hide and it'll cost you a premature life, death. And I'm trying to warn you as a man of God. God wants you here so that your ministry in your life helps preserve and bless and save others. It's better for you to stay. It's better for you to be able to live in warfare. It's better for you to switch your prayers from, my name is Jimmy, I'll take all you can give me, mine, 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 me, 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 why, 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 cry, 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 to stop it, devil, get off of him, Jesus' name, come, Lord, save him now. Which is better? For you to be on this earth to be God's blessing in other lives than die while you're whining and crying and wanting stuff. Now look back at Elisha and Gehazi. He said, is it a time to get things? No. What was he called to? If you go study their lives, it was God's plan for exactly what we're living right now. Elijah was anointed to destroy false religions and bring a wayward nation back to the true God. He transferred the mantle and Elijah was anointed to destroy demonic governments and bring a wayward nation back to the government of God. What do you think is happening right now? The battles over this nation serving idols and serving self, bringing them back to God, and they have not repented yet, and destroying the swamp, old established governments, and bringing the nation back to the ability to submit to the governments of God. The exact same thing. Yeah. But Gehazi wanted stuff. I'm telling you, it's not a time to pursue your will. And it will be put up with no more. Either to your own victories and glory for God or to your own demise. Now he did not say, this is not the time to pursue that stuff. But he didn't tell everybody in Samaria and Judea, you're all sinners for having houses. You're all sinners for having chariots. You're all sinners for having horses. He didn't say that that was a sin. But the focus on it became sin. Come on. I'm still going to have a nice house. I'll still have a nice car. But the pursuit of it has to stop. Amen. 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 And go back to the original promise of our Lord Jesus Christ. You seek the kingdom first, all this stuff will come to you. Consider it not. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. You'll never live a victorious life for Jesus Christ in the natural realm. With the right job, the right bank account, the right people, surrounded by the right husband, the right wife. None of that applies to your warfare. Most of it's used against you in warfare. You can't talk about Jesus, you'll lose your job. Most of it's twisted for the weapons of Satan's warfare against you. Why? Because you don't make the shift away from things unto completely his. Hallelujah. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty. Our weapons are powerful, folks. That's why they're immediately attacked the second you get off your knees. Your weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Things that control everybody around you, you have the ability to go into the spirit realm and jerk them down to the ground and under your feet. They're mighty. The effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man 
avails much. Consider Elijah, a man of like passions, wearing the same skin, with the same temper, the same fears as every one of you. But when he prayed, heaven answered and closed up. And he was no different than you. The effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man and woman of Almighty God can pull heaven down and push hell to your feet. Glory be to God. You're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down. Here's the battle. Casting down. Where's the battle start? Casting down. Imaginations and every high thing that tries to rule, exalt itself, and have preeminence and authority like COVID over the knowledge of God. By his stripes you were healed, but COVID won't let me leave the house. It's finally coming out. COVID's nothing more than another flu. All these masks Satan's made you work wear. Amen. Finally, the doctors are being heard. Amen. The whole time, it was useless, and they knew it. Yes. Masks don't stop viruses. They stop germs. Viruses are a thousand times smaller than germs. You've been walked around like a puppet from hell for no reason. Put the mask on, because we said so. And nobody with enough guts to say, I will not lie. Because you got to wear it to go to work. How hard is it going to be for that same group to take the stamp so that they could eat? Most of your so-called blessings are more easily used against you by hell than they promote the glory of God. Because they control you. Against the knowledge of God. 
And everybody around you that says they love you, it says, yeah, but. That's hell talking. I do have a gift to be around the big man. Why? Because we're surrounded by them under every household. You want to you find out just how little authority this Bible really has in most Christians' lives? Preach on godly women. <laughs> then you'll come closer to getting killed in church preaching what the Bible actually teaches women to be like than anything else. And it's really not even my job. But pastors have to do it now because the people that are called to teach on women becoming godly handmaidens of God don't do it. Who's that? The older women. The older women are supposed to say you shouldn't dress like a whore. The older women are supposed to say you shouldn't talk to your husband like that. The older women are supposed to teach on young women. Your career is not your goal. Your husband is. The older women are supposed to teach the younger women how to be godly in Christ. Ha! Good luck with that. And you think there's a man of God out there preaching on how to be a godly woman? He likes to live another two or three weeks. Don't tell me we're, we're ready to resist the forces of end time hell when we can't even keep from bowing to Jezebel in church. It's not right to sass your husband. It's not right to tell your husband what he's going to do. Amen. Amen. But on the other hand, husbands, it's not right for you to be a little boy expecting your wife to be a mama with benefits. Amen. First, you've got to be a godly man, not a sissy boy. And any man that don't work, don't eat. Any man that doesn't take care of his family is worse than an infidel. Any man that doesn't pamper, adorn, and worship his wife as Christ is a fake, a fraud, and a phony. Ask her what I did before I came to church. I wore dishes. I made the bed. I did a few things to help it be easier for her because she had other things she had to attend to. Well, <laughs> no. There's hardly any godly men in church either. They're either blowhards that don't serve Christ but want to be the captain of the ship or they're little sissy boys that want another mother with benefits. You're going to find out just how how drastically outside of the image of Christ, the body of Christ really is. And you're going to find it out in battle. Amen. You're going to find it out, well, how did this happen to me? Because you've had 20 years to become a man of God, and you're still playing. You've had 20 years to be a, a handmaiden of God, a woman of God, and you're still running the household like some kind of a barbarian. This stuff won't stand in battle, folks. And we have no consciousness to repent for it. Hallelujah. It's so in our pores, our DNA as a church, we don't even recognize sin. We better, if we're going to stand in the heat of battle, well, that's good preaching, guys. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Thank you for the truth, Lord. Most of our prayers are hindered by our, the lifestyle between amen and waiting for the there it is. And then we accuse God and accuse the Bible. Is there anybody that said, Pastor, you were, you were right on. I see six different things I didn't recognize before you started this teaching. I need to go home and start repenting about. Why? So you're properly equipped for battle. So 
so your heart doesn't condemn you in the heat of, of battle when it's time to take authority and dominion. But it's in the hopes of prayers and just carry on my life. Amen? Amen? Casting down thoughts and imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought. How many men think it's okay to lust after, well, I, I'm just a man. And you watch them in the mall. I watch them in the mall with their wives doing this. And it's so accepted the wives aren't even offended by it anymore. No, you've got a lustful spirit. You're disrespecting your wife. You're dishonoring God. And you never even think to repent of it in church. You don't even recognize sin. You've been taught, well, you're a man. That's, that, that, don't tell me not to have a ratchet head. All men look. The unrenewed ones do. The unrighteous ones do. The ones playing with God do. But a righteous man looks at her like his own flesh and has no affection for anything else. Amen. Whether it's walking by in the flesh or it's walking in front of his eyes on a computer screen. And pastors won't address this. I know it. Fine. Bury me in effigy. I don't care, but I'm going to tell you the truth. It's time to grow up, get right, get clean, get holy so we can fight. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll close. Maybe. Exaggeration has become so commonplace we don't recognize it as sin. Amen. We have no idea how corrupted we are in, in our day-to-day -day mannerisms with no standard of what the Bible is actually about, so we have no conviction. And we're naked. What did you, what did what did the Lord Jesus say to the uh, church of Laodicea? You're naked and wretched and undone and don't even know it. I accuse you to fix your eyes so you see right and buy oil so you can clean yourself and repent. We don't even recognize sin. We're inundated with it. It's a lifestyle. Anybody guilty of exaggerating all the time or is it just the pastor? <laughs> sure we do. Sure we do. All exaggeration is, is unchallenged lies. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I like, well, like, well, I'm not even going to go there. No, 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 no. I'm fighting too many devils right now. I'm not going to I'm not going to open that door. I was going to say something, and that really would have been on. I'm 60. This month, I'm turning 68. I'm finally getting a little bit of wisdom about when to shut my mouth. Just barely. But when it comes to God, I'll open my mouth and let it fall where it does on the earth. Are you ready? We know this, this chapter here, uh, Ephesians 6, is talking about the armor of God. Amen? If we need armor, it's because we're in a battle. And if you haven't fought any real battles yet, you've been hiding. Those days are over. Just settle it right now before you leave this sanctuary. Those days are over. Amen. The battle's coming to you whether you want it or not. Amen. Up until now, we begged, we pleaded, God to the field, fight for souls, bring them into bring them to Christ. Now the battle's in your living room. You will not be a bar. Amen. That battle came to your living room when people lost their jobs, jobs shut down, churches closed up, and have not reopened the day COVID dictated to them. That battle came into your living room. And it'll do nothing but get worse. 
Oh, well, we did it different. We just pull up in our cars and turn on our wipers for amen, hallelujah, and we have a drive-up service. What a bunch of swill. Amen, bro. What about absolute garbage? Amen. Well, we're going to worship as much as Antichrist will let us. Come on. I'm going to stand in the sanctuary of God's house preaching the holy word to God's holy people, and I will not bow, and I'm not doing it in the car. Amen. Now, if you're old and if you're feeble and infirm and you don't have faith for healing, stay home. But if you're not 80 plus years old and you're not fighting a pre-existing serious physical condition, rise up in faith and come to God's house. But this is all about the battle that's now in our living rooms. And it's the armor that we always should have been wearing. But I'm not going to take the time to read it all. You read it all when you get home. I want you to look right now at verse 13 and 14. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. So dressing up halfway, serving God halfway, is not the standard. It takes all of you to wear all the armor. I'll give God my heart when my body's in the disco. Well, go ahead and die. You gotta wear the whole armor. Your mind's gotta be in this. Your heart's gotta be in this. Your, your, your guts have gotta be in this. Your feet have gotta walk in this. It's the whole armor expecting all of you in it. For what? Battle. Amen? Verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able, not hope so, Able to withstand in the evil day. The evil day is now, child of God. If you think this is life is normal, or you're going to accept Satan telling you this is the new normal, you're going to die. Because this is the, just the first step of him taking everything from you. Having done all to stand. Not stagger, not waver, not consider. Stand. Having done all to stand, Mary, stand therefore. Amen. Everything changed around? What are you doing, Mary? I'm standing. It got worse. What are you doing? I'm standing. All hell's breaking loose. What are you doing? I'm standing. You lost your job. What are you doing? I'm standing. People are dying around. I'm standing! Amen. There's no other option. Stand therefore. Stand therefore. Look at Luke 21. I'm going to close. Stand therefore. Throat's a little dry, dry because I've been fasting and praying and uh, straining a little bit. Luke chapter 21. Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 21. Amen. <laughs> I was talking to Pastor Teresa, and I showed her another Bible. I said, you like this Bible? She goes, yeah, it's okay. I said, what do you mean it's okay? This is the one you thought was so beautiful. She goes, what do you mean the one? And I said, yeah, you know, the, that light Bible that... He said, oh, that's so pretty. I said, this is that before it got wore out to this. <laughs> that dark blue one used to be this. Or this used to be that. And she goes, well, I don't like that. I like the old one. <laughs> so I brought it today just so that she could enjoy my old Bible. Amen. Luke chapter 21. I want you to look at verse 17. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not one hair of your head perish or be lost. In your patience, possess your soul. So how do I keep my imaginations from carrying me into doubt and unbelief? Cast them down, control them. How do I keep my soul under control, mind, will, and emotions? Well, I better not get fired. That's all your mind. That's your, that's your emotion. That's your soul. 
In your patience, your soul becomes possessed, under control. You lose the battle when you lose your control of your soul and your emotions. How many of you have had people deliberately push you into responding in anger? Or, or to lose control over your emotions? You lose control over your emotions, you lose control over your faith and it falls to the ground. How do I control my soul, my emotions, mind, will, and emotions? How many of you know you're a triune man? Let me go back to that. You are a spirit. You have a soul. That's why in hell, the rich man looked up and saw Lazarus standing next to Abraham. And Abraham and Lazarus looked down and saw them. They recognized each other. Your spirit man looks exactly like your flesh man. Except without glasses, without false teeth, and without balding heads. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Lazarus looked down and saw the rich man. And the rich man, and it says, and the rich man in torment cried unto Abraham, Abraham, have Lazarus dip his finger in the water and touch my tongue and, and relieve me from this torment. He's in the spirit realm, but he's tormented. His mind is tormented. You are a spirit. You have a soul, mind, will, and emotion, and they live in a body. Your body's not in, in control as much as you think it is. Your soul is. Your body does. Your body's like a gun. It's not evil. It can either be on a policeman's hip or it can be on a terrorist's hip. It's just a gun. Your body is just a vessel. You can either use it to glorify God unto righteousness or glorify hell unto unrighteousness and death. The real you lives inside of it. And what controls what your body does is your emotions. That's why you cast down imaginations. Everything that says, yeah, but, you cast it down so that your emotions stay under control and you keep possession of your faith. You have to give up here before you relinquish there. Well, I know somebody tried that and they died. Oh, well, yeah, you're right. Now your imaginations have caused you to change your emotions and that relinquishes your faith. Amen. How do you solve that? Patience. That word patience in the Greek is hupomene. And it means this, continuance, consistency. Having done all the stand, what do I do? I continue to stand, patience. All hell breaks loose, what am I gonna do? I'm going to continue to stand. Well, what do you think TC's doing? He's constantly standing. In my continuance, and my consistency, I possess my soul. You don't have to ask me what I'm going to do next week. I'm serving God. You don't have to ask me what happens if the economy collapses. I'm serving God. You don't have to ask me if it becomes illegal to preach the word of God. What are you going to do? I'm going to serve God. I'm continuing. I'm consistent. I've never changed. If you get up off the ground and it's subject to conditions, you'll never see that there it is. All hell will make sure you change your mind. And relinquish your faith. Amen. Amen. How do I control my mind? Patience. Not, uh -huh. I'm just going to let him beat on me for, no. I'm going to stand for God, 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 stand for God. What are you doing? I'm standing for God. What are you going to do tomorrow? Stand for God. What are you going to do tomorrow? Stand for God. What are you going to do after that? Stand for God. Come back in a year, I'll be standing for God. I am the Lord God that changeth not. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. They don't change. Neither should you. Amen. Circumstance should not be able to change you. Sickness should not be able to change you. Emotions should not be able to change you. Angry people should not be able to change you. Opinions of friends should not be able to change you. I stand with God. Amen, Father. Thank you. Standing. Believing. Serving the Lord. Standing. 
believing, serving the Lord. Stand, here comes sickness, standing, believing, serving the Lord. Well, yeah, but cast that down, standing, believing, serving the Lord. Yeah, but my opinion, get back, hell, standing, believing, serving the Lord. Oh, I lost my job, standing, believing, serving the Lord. Oh, I'll break the loose, standing, believing, serving the Lord. And then you'll look up one day and say, look what the Lord has done. There it is. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Did you learn something today, church? Yes. Now, for everybody out on the internet, if you have not given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are not saved, and you are not part of the family of God, and if you died right now, well, here we go with the die right now, folks. I've talked to people, and they were dead within 24 hours. I may be talking to somebody out there right now, that if you don't listen to this man of God today, it might be the last day that you have a choice. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and your only hope of salvation and eternal life in heaven, for he said all others are thieves and robbers. Thieves and robbers of what? Thieves and robbers of your eternal soul. There's no way to God except through Jesus Christ. All others are thieves and robbers of men's lives and souls. If you have not done that, you have not bowed your knee in humble repentance, acknowledging your sin, you are surely destined for hell right now. And you may not be guaranteed tomorrow. You may not be guaranteed this, this very evening. For the rich man said, I know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm so blessed. Tomorrow I'm going to build bigger barns. And tomorrow's going to be just as blessed as it is today. And the Lord looked down from heaven and said, Thou fool, know you not that this very night I'm requiring your soul. You're going to die. And he died and went to hell. I'm speaking to people that may not be guaranteed tomorrow. But the grace and the glory, the love of God is reaching out to you right now. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He loved the world. He gave his son to the world that the world might not be damned to hell to have eternal life. Now, if you're out there and you know God's speaking to you, and you know it's time. And God has graced for you and touched your heart with the ability to repent and acknowledge that you're a sinner lost in your sins and destined for hell, but you're ready to change and make Jesus Christ not only your Savior, but the Lord over that new life. Then bow your heads and say this prayer with me. Everybody here at New Day Christian Center, say it with me also. Father God, I believe your word. I believe Jesus, your son, was sent as Savior of the world. I believe that you love the sinner like me and sent Jesus for me to pay on the cross the penalties of my sin. And now I accept that price. I accept that precious blood of Jesus. I accept Lord Jesus into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord. Jesus, come into my heart now. Be my Lord. Save me from my sins. Create a new person in me. Give me new birth. Right now, I make you my Lord. You're my Savior. I am your son. I am your daughter. I am saved. In Jesus' name, I'm born again. And from this moment on, I will serve you all the days of my life. Amen. Now praise him for that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, we had a lot of, the Holy Ghost had a lot of things today, didn't he? Amen. But it was good. Amen. It was good. Amen. I encourage you. I implore you. Go home and watch this at least twice. Take notes, meditate, pray about it. And then encourage somebody to watch it. If you 
because God knows many, 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 many believers need to hear what the Lord says today. Amen. 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 Pastor Darrell, will you please come and receive